Third, third day of this Sessicon. We had uh, two days of academics and today is going to be, um, in my view, going to be the most important day because we all want to always revise our basics, you know, have our basics strong and everything starts with clinically examining the patient. All this surgery, refining the technique, all this makes sense only when you make a good diagnosis. Without a diagnosis, everything goes waste because when you wrongly diagnose or wrongly prescribe a surgery to the patient, then the best technique also goes in vain. We've seen this many times, patients getting uh, a subacromial decompression done for a, a winged scapula. We see patients who have got, you know, diagnosed as instability, basically patients with scapular dyskinesis. Many times, uh, a, a wrong diagnosis, like all of us have seen patients come to us with the diagnosis of frozen shoulder while the patient has actually a cuff tap. I'll just qu quickly go through a couple of slides as to how I go through examining the patient. Uh, and then we have the world faculty here, the eminent faculty, and actually one of our patients, Mr. Sarunamurthy, he's actually a cop. Uh, he is kindly consented to come and uh, actually help us. So he's going to be here and our, pa our panel of eminent experts are going to examine him and show how they go about um, examining a patient. So we always have only a couple of minutes when we are in the uh, clinic. Um, in India especially, the clinics are crowded. We hardly get to spend about five to six minutes to, with a patient. So within that time, you have to actually ask the history. So you have to ask pertinent questions. You can't ask a, a very elaborate history there. So you have to ask pertinent questions and then you have to quickly examine the patient and clinch the diagnosis so that you can proceed with the relevant investigation. So I uh, call this a fast track examination of the shoulder. So usually start with the neck. So any pain in neck extension, so it just tells me that this patient has got some central issue. It's not only the shoulder or probably not the shoulder at all. Because many times in our colloquial terms, this area means the shoulder. So they, they come and say, tol valikide. So that means this area for them. So most of the time I, I, I end up seeing a lot of neck patients as well. So refer the patient to the spinal surgeon. I always look for a scapula and a trapezius trigger because this is what is... Uh, uh, taking a lot of patients to a clinic, especially the software engineers, people who are on the office, a lot of time. Examine from the back side, always examine the patient from the back. To start with, I look for active range of movement. I watch for the scapular movement, look, look at the dyskinesis, and then go for passive range of movement in the unaffected side. So once I, I'm convinced with passive external rotation on the unaffected side, then I start with active range of motion on the affected side, and then I go about checking the cuff strength, check for groove tenderness, ACJ, so this is sort of a, I think if I demonstrate it, it will be better. And then I make the patient lie down if it's a young patient and then check for apprehension relocation and jerk test as well. Always look for hyperlaxity and core strength in athletes. So once I've done this, in my mind, I come to uh, one of these six diagnostic clusters. So I know for sure if the patient has got frozen shoulder, especially if the patient has got complete loss of X-notation. So that gives me the diagnosis that this is a stiff shoulder, a primary frozen shoulder. Usually, you put a finger on the AC joint. The patient comes with pain here, putting a finger up here, then it is AC joint strain. And then obviously, instability patient tells you that there is um, uh, instability. But then there's subtle instability, scapular dyskinesis, disabled throwing shoulder and slap. This is a totally different group. These patients don't complain of instability, but they come with pain, reduced strength up here. And obviously, cuff tear patient, they have weakness. And then this whole group of patients who are the majority where there is bursitis, tendinosis, and secondary longer up biceps tendinitis. So these are the patients who we commonly see. And these are the challenging patients because they keep coming to us with pain. You inject them, you exercise them, they come back. You do an MRI, you see tendinosis, and they again come back. So this is uh, the sort of patient we have to work with the physio and also counsel the patient about the prognosis of the problem. So that's about this. So I'll now call upon the patient. I'll, I'll ask Dr. Pandey to come in first. He's a man. He can take the history, I think, small history, and then you can examine and then show how you go about, and then we can have the others.
first i want to tell to everybody very good morning to you and i am a ex service man from a commando team of sgf commando team oh, and i was in an anti hijacking and anti terrorist team and i am a national athletes so and at present last two months i went and participated for a state meet so before that i am a trainer in a gym also so i used to stay, uh, train the trainers and uh, students also so they were doing some overall weights so at that time just went to hold them i got a small stretch in my shoulder so i didn't mind that because the shoulder was strong and uh, muscle was strong so i went for the state meet there i had my main event was javelin throw so after the third throw i got a small cramp then i found i start paining then after that i had the pain in the nights then morning it was relieved then again in the night i had the pain then i thought it will uh, have some pain killers and it will uh, get it right then i didn't get it so after that uh, one week the pain started more then i analyzed the doctor he said we must take a scanning so we took a scan there i found okay before we go any further, <laughs> sorry it's a nice patient you know yeah it's a very nice very, very informative <laughs> patient do you have any night pain no night pain no night so he's got pain in the shoulder on activity yeah. that's it so full it. movement in your shoulder so for me this is the most important thing the patient has full so me there are two types of shoulder painful stiff shoulder painful not stiff shoulder so he has got a painful shoulder which is not stiff so i'm ruling out arthritis frozen shoulder so he is a sportsman he was throwing something and he is getting pain now i so history is important here so i'm thinking maybe he's got an instability problem or a rotator cuff problem so those are sometimes if he because he's 51 over an athlete they can also have acj joint problems so by just from the history i'm looking at a sports related injury either an instability cuff tear or an acj joint problem so let's do a quick examination so can you uh, take your top off for me please so I, it, it's a, just a simple very simplistic way of dividing your shoulder problem many times you can just look at the patient someone who's 20 30 years of age he will have instability problem someone who is 40 50 he'll have degenerative like impingement cuff tear frozen shoulder if they are 60 70 they are more likely to have arthritic problem of course it's not so clear cut but generally you can divide patient's age and tell where they are so the first thing i would do is i like look so you always look so i look at the front i look at for any asymmetry any abnormalities any scars sinuses is very symmetrical good pecs good deltoid biceps traps all are equal okay then i this is the shoulder sorry so then i'll look like this again i'm looking for any muscle wasting at the top supraspinatus infraspinatus any kyphosis and any other deformities which i'm say i'm not seeing anything then i look at back look at for any obvious swinging any again wasting and symmetry but while here while i'm here i will just ask can you lift both your arms up in the air and down no no i am behind him so i'm oh okay no. so i'm just looking at his scapular thoracic rhythm oh, let let's oh okay this way but he will turn around again so when he's done that i've looked at his scapular thoracic movement any winging any wasting any abnormal movements or clicks and clunks so come back again sir sorry i'm making you turn around these people are making you turn around can you face me now so so i've looked now so then i start feeling i start with a sternoclavicular joint So that's a very important joint which can give rise to shoulder problem most people can forget sternoclavicular joint so i start any pain here move around the clavicle any pain here so i'm looking at the acj joint pain i'm pressing here looking for acj sometimes you can always compare the two and press any no acj joint pain and i move my finger any pain here no so he's got no absolute tenderness anywhere so that is my feel and then i ask him to move so you just so if you turn around just do what i am doing so i ask him to lift up like this so he's got full forward elevation come down again can you do that he's got full abduction come down again can you tuck your elbows like this and do that so he's got almost symmetrical this is an important movement external rotation by looking at it you can tell he's symmetrical can you keep your elbows together and passively you can see he's got full 
external rotation. Again, you log, external rotation is limited, then you're looking at stiff shoulders. Then can you go back here? So he, he's got a little pain here, but he's got pretty good internal rotation compared to the other size. Can you go there? Okay, so he's almost equal internal rotation. So that's all giving me very good information. Then now I will do some tests. So first thing I'll look at is rotator cuff. Empty can sign, put your thumbs down like this. I'm going to push it down, don't let me push it down. Don't let me push it down. So it's got reasonable cuff, come back. Put here, put your elbows, there. push against me, push against me. He's got pretty good cuff power. Put your hands on your belly, push in, bring your elbows forward. He's got his good subscap. So I've looked at subscap, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minus. But from his history, we thought he's more of an instability problem rather than cuff. So his cuff is okay. So the first test I will do as far as instability, I'll just look at his apprehension test. Normally he will sit on a chair, but I will do it this way. So bring it beyond 90 and I stood. Is that, you can see he is not, he does not like it. So is everybody okay with that? So you brought it up like this and I took, you can see his face is turning a bit apprehensive. So he's got some problems with his anterior part of the shoulder, either a label tear or a capsule stretch. He's anteriorly unstable. While he's there, I'll do a posterior, take it across his body, push against. Is there any pain there? He's got pain there. So I'm pushing against the labrum. So this way he's got anterior and posterior problem, but sometimes it's difficult to diagnose posterior instability. While I'm there, I look for any sulcus sign because I know the problem is now, I've sort of narrowed it down to an instability problem. So I'm just looking for any sulcus sign. He's got no sulcus sign. We can also look for any laxity. We'll do a Bateman scoring. So all of you, I hope you know what Bateman is. I don't think he is very lax that way. You can do slap tests and things like that, but they're not very specific. But let's do it for him anyways. If you take it across, take it across, put your thumb down there. I'm going to push it down. Don't let me down. Don't let me push it down. He's got pain. But most people who have a label tear have this pain. And if you do it yourself, it's painful. So ideally, sorry. <laughs> and then we'll do quick nerve examination, axillary nerve. It's okay. Both feel equal, both sides? Yes. Yeah. And there is no neck pain you have. I test this thing. Then I will, because he's specifically about insulin, I don't have to do all the tests all the time. But yes, I can do an Hawkins test. Is that painful? I do Hawkins test in two, three. No? And then I can always look. This is the scarf test for ACJ. No pain there? So he was not tender over the ACJ joint. So he's unlikely to have. So my diagnosis in, sorry, what's your name? Sarvanan's right shoulder would be, he's probably got an instability, anterior instability. So if I have to do some test, I will do a, either a 3D, 3T MRI scan or a MR arthrogram to look at his rotator cuff. Although clinically he also has some avulsion of his biceps anchor but it's not very obvious clinically, but that may be a, a problem. But the problem is labral. There is a labral pathology here, anterior or posterior. I will look at the scan, but most likely he's got an anterior labral pathology. And that is five minutes. I don't know if you do it any differently, Bruno. Gosh, that was good. That was really fantastic. So you guys are really lucky to hear that. And uh, I, I pretty much agree with everything you've said and the way you've done things. And, but I think in a forum like this, maybe it's useful just to go through again a little bit. So first of all, when the patient walks in, the age of the patient, you're so right that in different age groups, there's more likely to be different pathologies. So when we see someone in their teens or 20s, 
We're not likely to see rotator cuff or glenohumeral humeral arthritis or frozen shoulder. We're thinking more of labral instability, AC joint. And when we see someone middle-aged, we're thinking cuff, uh, maybe some uh, frozen shoulder, maybe some arthritis, and older, the same thing, with a perhaps different emphasis. So you think of the age of the patient. Even a very active patient, when they're uh, my age, the tissue is still different. So um, the failure points, you can be active and fit, but we're thinking more cuff likelihood sometimes in general in this age group than, than labral. Secondly, uh, was there some sort of a, an event? Um, and just tell me, sir, you were throwing the javelin, you had an awareness that it wasn't right, That means uh, I couldn't go to the extreme limit. When I go to the extreme limit, I had a light pull so that the javelin was not going forward. So was that at the beginning of the beginning. throw? Second. So here, at the yeah. beginning of the throw, you felt you had an aware something. There was a moment. And now the first three movements were equal. Yeah. And the fourth movement, when I was able to release my javelin, yeah. at that time I have a stretch. Okay. Yeah. So really from the, the wind-up stage all the way through the acceleration and the release, there was yeah. pain. And nowadays, when do you have symptoms? Do yeah. you have something all the time or only with activity? No, there What's was no like? wind. Wind was from the opposite side also, yeah. but it was only normal, one small yeah. wind, that's all. Yeah. So now, this week, what's it like now for you? No pain, no resting? Just no resting, nothing pain. No pain. No pain's enough. Uh, that means I couldn't uh, raise my hand while combing. You're yeah, opening my T-shirt. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. that's the thing. Then I couldn't uh, for yeah, more body active. Suddenly, if I uh, think to slap someone, I couldn't bring that movement. So basically, no pain at rest. Pain with a sudden pain with a sudden movement. Yeah. Uh, and overhead. And you said before, night pain, not so much. No, so no. Much. Okay. So that's important because certainly with cuff. You think about night pain, same with frozen shoulder. Now, <coughs> examining the patient, oh, can you point to the pain? Can you point to it? Sure. Yeah, it's here. In examining the patient, what I want to separate out, is it glenohumeral or is it subacromial? Karthik showed a list of kind of diagnostic possibilities, and if you put dislocation as a clear thing that you can elicit from a history, in many cases, you know, a, a, a full dislocation, in a patient in uh, sort of my age group, is it glenohumeral or is it subacromial? And basically, um, I agree with the, the algorithm of, like we were taught at please as well, look, feel, move, special tests. And so if we look, just sit up straight, sir. So we look, we see his posture is good, he's very, very well muscled. There's no AC joint uh, prominence or anything to suggest a dislocation. Thank you. And so I like to have the patient seated and to be able to look from above the patient at the profile of the shoulder. And it may not be so obvious from where you are, but the right shoulder is quite protracted uh, in the sitting position compared to the left. If I just bring this back a little bit. That's it. So. And so often these patients, I agree with Karthik, have a trapezius Trigger point as well. Uh, people with shoulder pain. Pain? Oh, no. Okay, that's good. And then examining the AC joints. 
No pain? Okay. And then examining for tenderness around the biceps groove area. Pain? No. And he was able to show me, it's always worth asking the patient, like he was able to show me that area of pain, which is just in the anterior deltoid, just here, just in the anterior deltoid, just in front of the anterior margin of the acromion, just in just this position here. Okay, so now I want to see glenohumeral versus subacromial, a little bit of screening here, the elbow by the side. So external rotation around 35 degrees, so certainly there's no shoulder hyperlaxity and the arm by the side. External rotation, S symmetrical, no pain. Hold the arm here please, resist, be strong. So good external rotation strength. Can you raise both your arms up, all the way up? Okay. Can you put your hands behind your head, please, sir? Does that bother you? Okay. So, thinking now, glenohumeral versus subacromial, it's not looking glenohumeral at all. Pain? Okay. So, I mean, glenohumeral as far as frozen shoulder or osteoarthritis, it's not looking like that. It doesn't seem particularly irritable in the glenohumeral joint, and this is more of a um, either a GERD or a posterior, uh, posterior or a or a subacromial problem. And now Hawkins pain? No, a little bit. Okay, examining for some labral pathology. Palm up. Hold it. So this way. Strong. Push up. Okay. Little bit. Straight ahead. Push up. AC joint. That's painting. All these are so non-specific. Whipple's anterior supraspinatus test. Push up. Okay. And then thumb down. O'Brien's test. Push up. And this is painful. Okay. That's fine. So put your shirt on. So basically there was an event. He doesn't have any signs of a frozen shoulder or glenohumeral arthritic process from his uh, history or range. Uh, he can localise a pain. It's an activity related pain. And the things that provoke the shoulder mostly as far as the tests go were palpation, just anterior to the acromion. And there was some aggravation with the very non-specific uh, labral tests and also some pain and a slight decrease in abduction internal rotation. So really I think now we go to the imaging to try and put together whether there is uh, a, a labral problem as Dr. Pandeep suggested or whether perhaps there may be something like a superior margin subscap tear, this age group activity, a sudden event, maybe coupled even with some long, subtle long head of biceps instability. Have a volunteer. Someone to volunteer? I'm all like the volunteer. <laughs> He's too painful and is keen to slap, so we'll just leave him now for now. <laughs> yes. Thank you. It's good. Perfect. Morning, sir. Take a seat. I have the same shame for the examination. Uh, I start by the story of the of the pain of the uh, symptoms of the shoulder, and after that, uh, you can. Uh, take uh, top off, please. 
and after the first step is uh, inspection, you look like you do uh, you you do be just before. You can uh, I look anteriorly. This uh, level of the two shoulder, the aspect of the pec major, of the st sternoclavicular joint and uh, EC joint, and after that, I move like this to check the posterior aspect of the shoulder, the uh, atrophy of the uh, infraspinatus or su uh, supraspinatus is. Uh, more difficult to see, but infraspinatus is very easy to uh, check the atrophy of the muscle. And after that, uh, uh, I start to examine, and uh, I start with the cervical neck to check it's uh, it's okay. There is no pain when you move the um, cervical spine. And after. Uh, you can elevate your shoulder like this. You check the uh, trapezius like this. And after I palpate the EC joint, it's not painful. And I'll palpate also uh, along of the uh, spine to check the rhomboid muscle. And after I start to check the movement, lift up. Both should uh, together go uh, go back in abduction like this. Go back and you check the uh, this kinesia of the scapula. You check the movement of the scapula is uh, totally symmetric and it's okay. After that, I mean the external rotation is the most important point in uh, examination, actively and passively. And you check, resist me, okay? And you check the second. Uh, you compare always the two shoulders. After that, you move the arm in this position, move uh, and push it here. You check the uh, subscapular is like this. Lift off the est, and you check the uh, subscap again, and you check the internal rotation mobility. I mean, it's very important to check it too. You go here, elevate, it's painful, little bit, <laughs> good, you are a good, uh, good case. And uh, after that, I check the Bayrog test, I mean, for the upper part of the subscap is very interesting, resist, is not painful. You can test the uh, Hawking test. No, like this, it's, it's not painful in this position, and no. You can make the arm very far, like this. No, uh, the end very far posteriorly, and resist me, it's painful. It's a cross arm test for the EC joint. And after that, you pull the arm in this position, like this, the job test and after the palm up test. And for instability, I like to check the gaget test to have an assessment of the inferior capsule. You see, it's, it's normal. You, you lock, move the, like this, you lock the uh, scapula like this, and you move the arm in this position. And that is 95 degrees, it's normal. And you check other side and you compare every time the two uh, gadget tests. It's very important to have a good assessment on the inferior capsule. And after you can check the O'Brien test, but it's not very sp specific, it's painful. <laughs> he has uh, some problem too. And uh, after that you can check the jerk test. It's painful? No. Here. Thank you. you can. And after, you have a good assessment of the shoulder. You have seen uh, uh, stati uh, static, uh, static position of the shoulder. Uh, you have appreciated uh, 
dyskinesia and you have check every uh, muscle and uh, you can ask, you can see the uh, uh, X-ray or MRI to finish your examination and find your uh, clinic uh, assessment and uh, your diagnosis. All of you is probably what is the most important thing. So each one of you uh, sort of went around systematically examining the patient and then came out almost close to what the patient has actually. So I will show you the MRI now. Yeah. <laughs> the result will be announced after some time. <laughs> So in a stiff shoulder situation, how do you document the range of moment in day one and then follow it up? So you have to document on day one what was the range of movement of this patient? Abduction, flexion, external rotation, internal rotation. How do you do it? Just show it on me. Fro frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder. At on day one my range of movement. At the beginning. The stiff shoulder, the most important thing of the stiff shoulder is a deficit of external rotation. Yeah, like diagnosis like is made. Yes. Now it is, I'm sending it to the physiotherapist by documenting what is the range today so that I can document after three weeks. So uh, what I will do is, you want angles as to what yeah, the Yeah, documentation. Angle. Yeah. So there, no, no, that's okay. Diagnosis is no uh, problem. Yeah, so diagnosis, so this is neutral for me and that is 45 degrees and this is 90 so if you are so basically I would you don't have to sort of say 32 degrees or third so if I, that is there this is about 30 45 60 90 so that is my you can also do it this way but this is a bit more difficult in a frozen shoulder so what movements do you document so I document forward elevation so okay, that is then. forward elevation. This is 90. And forward elevation, I put it in the uh, axis of the scapula. So it's not here. It's about somewhere here in the middle. And this is 90. So, and this is 100. And so you do it in the axilla, uh, in the line of axilla? Not it's line of scapula. scapula. Line is, of that, scap is that what most people do? Yeah. So line of scapula. So I would, this is 90. This is 45. So I can sort of give you a rough idea as to on this it was like that after three months I will be from 45 to 45, 60, 90, uh, 105, 130. So and you measure forward flexion and you measure external rotation. External. How about IR? So internal rotation, if it can be painful. Do you document that? Yeah, so if the, if the patient can do it, so you can be either. But you can always do it, tokenter so and maybe buttock. Buttock, <coughs> lumbosacral junction, higher. Mostly frozen shoulder will be very quite painful to do that. And if you see most frozen shoulder, they, can, they won't be able to get there. So if you document the external rotation, forward elevation, you can probably do more abduction rather than internal rotation so much. But you can, but it is important, as you say, it's a very important point to document where you are. That is the only way you can show that there has been progress made. One, one, can I? Dr. Pandey, Dr. Bruno, um, when you record or document these motions, it is the composite motion of the shoulder or only glenohumeral joint motion, which you, which you record? It is very difficult to so, isolate so, the... So tool. just compose it. You don't stabilize the scapula or anything. Just composite so, motion of the shoulder. You can put your hand on the scapula. So you don't need to. Yeah, you don't need to, but... Again, but your documentation has to be this thing. You can't document one time stabilized yes. scapula, another time unstabilized scapula. I think the majority but, uh, of surgeons take a global assessment of movement. The glenohumeral separately, am I correct? I agree. Yeah. So because I think it's, it's exclusive glenohumeral uh, movement is confusing. That's right. Confusing. For me, external rotation with the arm at the side, active and passive. Forward elevation in the... Um, Plane of the body. Board, plane of the body. Yes. The, the reason I want to ask about yeah. that question is that if you send the lumbar segments, if you send the patient to physiotherapist, they will not do this plane of the scapula. Yeah. They do only in the front yeah. of the body, and then they calculate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you want to compare the one stage assessment to follow up, if you send the patient to physiotherapist, they will do only forward perpendicular to the body. When the patient comes back to you, you yes. do the same what you do. 
Absolutely. You will know whether they improve progress or not. Yes, to check the progression of yes, the patient, so I, you need have I, always the same. Uh, well, let's ask when the like question I raise it because me and me and Shishank keep discussing this something very stupid, something very basic, and I do it differently. So let me tell you, and I don't know whether it is logical. So I am interested in in a frozen shoulder. I am interested in glenohumeral joint. So on day one, I document glenohumeral joint, not global movement. Global movement is functionally important to the patient. This is patient's viewpoint. My viewpoint is how much is the movement at the glenohumeral joint, whether that is improving or not. So what I do is this. I stabilize the scapula, both sides. I stabilize and look at the abduction. Abduction is only this much, 30 degree. If you ask the patient to abduct, he will actually abduct 90 degree because he is doing everywhere. Okay? So I stabilize. So my, my documentation, I want to know exactly what is the glenohumeral joint movement. So I stabilize the scapula, do the abduction on this side, and also on the other side, I write 30 oblique 90. Some patients have 120 normal. So their 90 may be actually normal for you, but that's not normal. So I write 30 oblique 110. So I know this is my target. Similarly, external rotation. I do like this, stabilize the scapula again, 30 degree against 101 degree, which could be 120 degree if you leave him alone. You can go all the way like this. And similarly, about internal rotation. Where can he go? He can go up to here and then come back, oblique. So my point is that we are looking at surgeon, as surgeons movement improvement at glenohumeral joint. Patient is looking at overall improvement, which is fine from his viewpoint. When do I tell him, okay, your glenohumeral movement has improved, unless I'm focusing on glenohumeral joint? Oh, just a just, uh, just slight difference in opinion. Uh, basically, if, if you're assessing glenohumeral joint movement, if that is going to improve, your global movement is also going to improve. So what is that particularly you have to look at? I understand from an uh, assessment point of view, you want to know what is the contribution from glenohumeral joint as well as compensation. But for progress, it is quickly quick to do uh, lift up and do that. Of course, I say you have to make sure that the patient is not compensating like uh, tilting like that. So if that is the case, sitting, yeah, and sitting. doing things symmetrically. Okay, oh, number one is either stop. sitting and doing. Yeah. Otherwise, in my practice, I will ask them to lie down on the couch and ask them to uh, do that. That, that uh, obviate all the problem with the spine and arching. See, that is reproducible. When you do the global movement, that probably is more reproducible than the um, every time you need, when you record it, rather than uh, looking for it yourself. Yeah. Then you are consistent in whatever you do. The problem happens if I am measuring once and you are sending it to somebody else, and they are measuring by what you are saying. Then there can be a discrepancy. But uh, I mean. You are being a purist, and that is absolutely so, so, fine. But so let me give you an example. Very often, this has happened between two senior shoulder surgeons. Mm. So I come and say, okay, the external rotation is, I do it like this. I stabilize, do it like this. It is 10 degree. But you're not looking at his pain. How will you know his pain? No, no. I'm not talking about pain right now. That is very important. Of course. You can't just push stuff. Of course. Of no, no, course. I, do, I, I, do, I, I do have a mirror in my office. I understand so, that. Please. Now, now, the question is, the other person comes, and he says, external rotation, he does like this. And actually, everything is happening here. So for documentation, my, for yeah. me, external rotation is 10 degree. For him, it is 50 degree. Now, who is right? Yeah. So then we should always, always record your... All right. Yeah. You should always record your green humoral. Yeah. If you ask the patient to lie down. Lie down. He can easily lift. Abduction may be more. So then... But if he extends, the movement may be less. And it differs from person to person. The patient will have a tricky movement. By so if you want said, glenohumeral movement, move like this. So you record stabilize yeah. and do this. Correct. You record it lying down. So your scapula is stabilized. With your scapula stabilization also, I'll show you some people who will stabilize it like this. Some people will stabilize it like this. Some people will stabilize it like this. Which is right. Maybe now scapula... If you... It's easier... The patient will be leaning on the board. That's what I do. External rotation. So that you, you won't stabilize, stabilize. Just yeah. opposite side, I'm stabilizing the opposite side. And so that... Okay, I, I would like to ask one burning question to all three uh, faculty who examine the patient. Uh, you said uh, go for MRI. The patient does usually comes with, uh, to us with MRI only. Now, in your practice, do you think, will you do consider doing an X-ray for this patient you examined? So, yeah. always do an X-ray. You said MRI, you didn't say X-ray. Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm 
No, no, I'm just asking. But, but, but with this particular patient, young, sportive, yeah, you're yeah. thinking about slap instability, the patient comes with MRI to you, and you have seen the MRI, then will you get an X-ray? That's the second part of the question. Uh, yes. First, will you get the X-ray so, first? Second, if you so, come with the MRI, will you yeah. get So, number one, uh, to answer your questions, yes and yes. And have you heard of Choosing Wisely? The, it's an international campaign, very big. Because I want to stress Canada this to the and everything oh, delegates. Like that. So I'm involved in our, you know, uh, orthopedic and health kind of ministry things. And so the Choosing Wisely thing, and we were asked to provide something for the shoulder. And the, the first thing, just to give them one thing, to, I said, uh, if a patient with a shoulder problem is having imaging, always get a plain X-ray. And so, yes, always so get a plain X-ray. I think X -ray. which is very important, especially if you are in your 50s, remember, shoulder is a common place for secondaries. Metastasis. 50s. In 50s. So uh, I, at least once a year, will see somebody who's had ultrasound, and no cuff tear, physiotherapy, you do an X-ray, they got a met, so, you know, multiple so myeloma. Shoulder is it? Shoulder AP or shoulder true AP? Yeah, so basically true AP, uh, so you have the true AP of the shoulder, the scapula lateral, and an axillary view. I don't go, I don't think we need special views in plain imaging, but Dr. all the Bruno? age groups, young age group, say Bankart type uh, pathology, Hill Sachs, middle age, we haven't mentioned calcific tendonitis. You yes. could have somebody who's active and fit, he's 50, some, uh, he has some calcific tendonitis that starts to hurt in, when he's throwing a javelin. So in, in this age group, spurs. 50, calcific tendonitis uh, can happen, yeah, yeah. and a small flex of calcium sometimes can be missed in MRI. Mm -hmm. Oh, it that's right. It won't be seen, but the uh, X-ray will pick it up. Yeah, and then yes, the so differential are between are frozen with shoulder and X-ray is a fundamental uh, during the examination. You need to have an X-ray every time. I think the message for our population has it. I don't see true AP done ever. Ever, almost ever, in my city of Delhi, shoulder AP means AP. It's not true AP. I think all those sitting here should at least take one message home that tomorrow morning all your AP should be true APs. And you can Google what it means, how to, how to do it. It's a simple X-ray. So rather than AP, do a true AP for shoulder pathologies. And also, one for, message. Uh, also one last statement, that not every instability, if it's a 20-year-old who's had multiple dislocations and clinically they are apprehensive, you don't always have to do MRI scan. My old boss used to never, that is a, so don't, don't over-investigate. But X-ray, always. Uh, this is uh, uh, for foreign faculty. Could you tell us the only one test for each, patho each pathology? Only one test. So which test do you want to do for a slap? The, the only one test. For a slap, a rotator cuff, a liberal. Okay, so slap, don't diagnose clinically. I've seen some fantastic uh, orthopedic shoulder surgeons who can't diagnose slap. Slap is mostly, yes, you can do the O'Brien's test, but if everybody does O'Brien's test here, all of you will be painful. So all of you got a slap test. But I think it's more, even in MR arthrogram, you will miss slaps. So mostly it is done on arthroscopy. Yeah. So clinically, no. But if you want uh, one test... There are four, in my book, there are only four useful tests in, in shoulder which work. Cuff, impingement, scarf test, and instability, that test. All the other tests, Speeds, Jergasons, you name it, there are at least 60 of them. Uh, they are sometimes hit and miss. Four tests. Cuff, this empty can, external rotation, belly press, good. They are as good as an MRI scan. In my, in my book. Do you want to show? What the so, um, do you want to show me? Who asked the question? Who asked, who asked the question? I like your question. 
you know, and so uh, it's a challenge. So uh, basically, AC, tender, that's my one test, tender, um, frozen shoulder arthritis, limited external rotation, that's my one, you know, and then you need an x-ray to differentiate. Um, cuff, Hawkins, uh, slap, I agree, non-specific, but I'll do this test that Buddy Savoir demonstrated that uh, resisted abduction and pushing the humeral head with your other hand upwards. It's just so non-specific, but to answer your question, that's going to be my one test, and then instability apprehension. I do it in the plane of the scapula. Well, it should not be beyond 90. But 30 degrees is such a non-specific. You don't get a goniometer and measure. So it's somewhere in this region, that's fine. Yeah, less than 90 degrees. Somewhere. Then you can ask, where do you put the pressure? Should you put the pressure here? Or you put the pressure at the elbow? Because somebody's got a tennis elbow or instability, then you'll have other problems. <laughs> so there Yes. Excuse me, sir. So one doubt, sir. Suppose we're doing the test for the cuff and there is no weakness. Patient only has pain. And uh, so how do we address that? Like when do we get decide to get an MRI if patient has pain on cuff testing without weakness? Yeah, that's a very interesting. Some of them will have only pain and not so much weakness because they got very huge deltoids and they can compensate for that. So I would say if they have pain, I would think that keep that as a positive. Because and you want to be erring on the side of caution. So what is your, like, how, when would you advise an MRI in such a patient? No, you, in, if they have pain on doing that and external rotation, what is the problem? Again, not so much weakness. Grade 4 power and pain. Grade 4 power is weak. No, but that's a pain injury. Yeah, that's what. So if you have on external rotation and this thing, the only pain on both sides and no weakness, I'll get a, I'll scan them too. <laughs> 